Will Yemen finally see a turn for the better in 2019? Last month's peace talks in Sweden raising hopes that the tide had finally turned in a nation battered by nearly four years of civil war with the ensuing famine, having a three quarters of the population dependent on humanitarian assistance. But the truce and prisoner swaps promised in December have yet to materialize. Much of the pressure of late has been on the Saudis and the Western Bank coalition. They've been leading in airstrikes that continue to kill innocent civilians. But the United Nations and its mediation teams have voiced exasperation with both sides. France 24's team went to the north, to territory held by Iran-aligned Houthi militias. Militias that have consolidated their grip on the capital, Sana'a, since the assassination a little over a year ago of the country's longtime former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Are the Houthis honoring the commitments they made in Sweden, in particular when it comes to the agreed truce in and around the strategic port city of Hodeida, gateway to food and supplies for 70 percent of the country? We'll be going to Hodeida in a moment. Today in the France 24 debate, we're going inside of Yemen's civil war. Joining us from Washington, Sama Al Amdi Hamdani, visiting fellow at uh, Georgetown University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. From Sanaa, Hussein uh, Al Bukhati, a journalist and commentator, welcome to the show again. Hello, thank you for having me. And Gadel, executive director of Paris's Open Diplomacy Institute. Hello. Thanks Good for evening. being with us. Thanks for having me. And uh, before we go to our panel, just to tell you that uh, we, for, and before we turn to the first of those reports, let's welcome France 24's uh, Cyril Payen. You and uh, Hamar Al Hamidawi, uh, you uh, filmed the stories we're about to see. Uh, and just to give us the context of under what conditions. You filmed them. Well, we have, we have been able six months ago to, have, to go in the southern part of Yemen, and I can tell you this, this time was radically different in terms of destruction we have seen on the ground on the Houthi side in northern Yemen, but also in terms of uh, uh, being handled by the Houthi. So we, we have been there, invited by the Houthi militias, which is quite rare. Uh, but we had the minder all the time. We had some uh, Houthis officials or militiamen uh, following us all the time, taking notes of uh, people we were talking to, um, directing us about what to film, what not to film, especially in hospitals or close to front lines. So it was uh, extremely directed. Um, and it, it ended by we spent uh, we had the chance to spend 24 hours in this very key place, which is the data. This is the uh, the window to, through the the outside world on the Red Sea, and uh, they just expelled us after 24 hours because uh, it was like uh, uh, they couldn't handle more about what we had, we are doing there with the local population asking questions. They just do basically doing our job. So it was a uh, heavy pressure for 15 days, 10 days basically on the ground, uh, with some uh, manners which, which were beyond being minders. They were really redirecting us. And at the end, they just say, you have to leave now. And when you were in Hodeida, did you have a sense that, well, this prisoner swap, this truce is near or not at all? Frankly not. Because which, uh, when we arrived in the, in the port of Odeda, there were some uh, airstrikes going on, some snipering, some snipers at some, uh, in some streets. And frankly, when we talked to the locals, but it's not only in Odeda, where there is a truce, there should be some ceasefire for weeks now. Uh, the locals in Sana or in Tsada, in, a, in the, the, the stronghold of the Houthis, nobody really believe of this uh, United Nations broken peace talks or ceasefire, whatever you, 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 you say it is, uh, nobody really believes in peace in the short term for, for Yemen. People are very sadly uh, desperate about the situation there. And we're going to see the report that you filmed in Sada in part two of our discussion. Cyril Payen, many thanks. I know you've got to rush off pleasure. to the Arabic language uh, set where uh, they're also taking a look at uh, your reporting. Inside Yemen's flashpoint of Hodeida, a France 24 report by Cyril Payen and Omar Hal Amadawi. It's only after crossing several mountain ranges and a desert inside Yemen that one arrives at one of the world's most isolated cities. Hodeida, a crucial outlet to the Red Sea and the wider world, where war has raged for several months. Hodeida is a fortified city split in two by the front lines. Our Houthi militia escort guides us to the port this is where the majority of Yemen's food and humanitarian aid would be coming in, were it not for the war. 
The area is strategically crucial. In spite of an official ceasefire, fighting continues. The Houthis are nervous. What's going on here? Who gave them authorization to enter? If they stay, you're taking responsibility, OK? In fact, we're soon met by a leader of the rebellion. You see this port is the most vital location in Yemen. It's also the most attacked and the most destroyed. And why? Because the coalition uses it as a weapon to push its strategy. We, the Houthis, are responsible for the transport of more than 70 percent of Yemen's food. There are 20 million Yemenis depending on supplies that should be arriving on these docks, but that aren't. Around the city, the words of Houthi propaganda aren't very far from the reality on the ground. Looming famine, non-stop bombardment, and an international diplomacy struggling to put the brakes on civil war. For decades, the fish market has been a daily meeting point for thousands of families. Like all of Yemen, it's now a shadow of its former self. Few fishermen dare heading out these days. It's terrifying. The planes are constantly buzzing us. These days, going out on the water means taking huge risks. When people go out, half the time they don't come back. They bomb everything as soon as they see a light. Even us, simple fishermen, we're targets. Millions in the country are already hanging by a thread, while Hodeida, lifeline of Yemen, is coming undone. Samal Hamadani, your reaction to what we just heard from that report? I mean, it's not very shocking, unfortunately. It's, it's a normal reaction of the devastation that's going on. Unfortunately, the last ceasefire did not hold uh, or continue in the way that we hoped that it would. And so what's happening now in Yemen is what we're witnessing is just uh, some sort of a psychological loss of hope and also the continuation of a long-term war, something that has taken place for more than three years. And so it, it's, it's really devastating. What we know is that 80 percent of the Yemeni population depends on humanitarian aid. Hodeida was one of the most important sites when it comes to that regard. And so far, a lot of Yemenis, although they're not very optimistic about the peace process, they would like peace to happen. And so a lot of us are holding our breaths, waiting for the next step and for the next step being, you know, the exchange of detainees, uh, the ceasefire, absolutely, and then to start the talks again, which were supposed to happen towards the end of this month. And now we have places like Amman uh, and the city of Kuwait that are offering uh, their cities as a location where these talks can take place. And so there are a lot of people who are not very optimistic about the peace process, but without a doubt, it is the only thing that they are seeking. We have the UN Special Envoy to Yemen working to convene a face-to-face -face meeting in Hodeida of the committee tasked with overseeing the deal that was struck in Sweden last month. Uh, Martin Griffiths, who arrived in the country for the second time this month on Monday. He was expected then to travel on to Riyadh at some point, where the internationally recognized government sits. Uh, also under discussion from Monday will be disagreements between Yemen's Houthi rebels who hold Odeida and retired Dutch Major General Patrick Kamert. He's the man who heads a UN mission charged with monitoring the ceasefire. Last week, his convoy came under fire. No injuries. The two belligerent sides blame each other for the attack. Uh, there's a sense uh, that uh, the patience is wearing thin at the UN Security Council. Here's what the UK ambassador said last week. As far as the situation on the ground goes, uh, there has been a welcome de-escalation uh, around Hodeida, but there are still provocative acts uh, being carried out, uh, particularly by one of the parties. Uh, Hussein al-Bukhadi, uh, a lot of people pointing the finger at the Houthis this time, saying that uh, they're really pressing a hard line, especially around Hodeida. Uh, what does need to be done when it comes to uh, getting that prisoner exchange up and running? 
first of all for the Hudaida, the uh, Ansar Lada Houthi has uh, withdrawn from uh, Hudaida port. Uh, this was the first step in the first uh, stage. And the second step uh, was for the Saudi backed forces to withdraw from uh, east of Hudaida, especially in area called Kilo 16. Uh, where the main road from Hudaida to uh, Sana'a. Uh, but still, till now, they haven't uh, done so. And it was really uh, funny that the UN uh, committee or observers in uh, Hudaida, uh, they didn't know who shot at them. I mean, their job was to know who is not uh, uh, holding uh, this ceasefire. Uh, they should actually have a check what area they were in. They could check what type of bullet was shot at them from where and the distance. So uh, just imagine, how can they... Uh, be sure that they can keep the ceasefire. And yeah, about regarding, the I just want to pick up on that point of regarding re regarding on that point of who controls the port. Um, our reporters say that uh, there is this maritime corps that's replaced uh, the militias, but that maritime corps they had the definite sense that they answer to the Houthi authorities. They, those are are the local uh, authority, and if they still. Uh, loyal uh, to to uh, to Ansar the Houthi. Uh, this is uh, normal because we know that the war in Yemen has divided uh, Yemen in two. Uh, so you can't find, for example, uh, people who are support uh, the Houthi in uh, who are holding a position uh, in uh, Saudi-backed forces-controlled uh, area. But the main point was that the ma the main. Uh, fighting force of the Houthi has withdrawn, and those are just uh, security uh, security men uh, in 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 the in the local forces, local authority in in Hudaida. But still, I mean, if the United Nations see that the Houthi has did not withdraw, they should actually release a statement. They have their ob observer there, and but to be silent like that, this actually will will make it really easy for media uh, to uh, like to make up uh, things like what the Saudi-led coalition is doing. And uh, about the prisoner exchange, the Ansar the Sana'a delegate were, were ready uh, with the list uh, of their prisoners uh, in the Saudi hand, uh, in the Saudi backed forces. But the uh, other side uh, has submit only after uh, the talk uh, a list of 900, uh, 9,300, uh, 2,400. Uh, are, are repeated in name. One, one, uh, 111 are Al-Qaeda uh, members, and 1,100 those people has been released uh, when Houthi struck deals with some uh, tribesmen. But still, they haven't admitted one of the main problems, that they haven't... Uh, the Saudi, uh, Saudi has 1,540 1, uh, uh, prisoners from uh, Ansarullah the Houthi. Mm. They only admitted 700. United Arab Emirates has 1,500. 1, 1, they said we haven't had we haven't had anything in anyone, and the Saudi uh, the forces local forces in Yemen, which backed by the Saudi, have about four thousand. They admitted only seven hundred. So you just imagine. All right, so a lot can, of lot of dis uh, a lot I mean, of distrust they, they there. They made up their list. A lot of distrust there. And Gadel, how do you make the ceasefire work in Hodeida? How do you make the ceasefire work in Houdet? Well, first of all, you're right to stress out that uh, there is no trust between parties now. Mm. We had hopes that with the Hodeida agreement, the agreement signed uh, in uh, Sweden last month, uh, trust will be restored, and it was actually the main point of the agreements. However, uh, now the situation in Hodeida, which has been for a long time a fortress for the Houthis, uh, clearly, clearly trust uh, is not there, is lacking, and hope for reaching an agreement, a peace agreement, and even coming back to the peace talks is really diminishing. So I think that first of all, what needs to be restored is really the work of the UN, uh, the UN committee, the, the UN monitors. And to that regard, we're expecting a lot uh, from uh, Mr. Griffith's uh, meetings today in Sana'a. Uh, how does he play it? Because you, you just heard uh, yeah. uh, there Hussein say, look, if, if, if he thinks that it's the Houthis violating the ceasefire, he should come out and say it. How, does he, how should he play it at this point? Well, it's really difficult to say because ever since the agreement was reached or not so reached uh, last month, both parties have been blaming each other for not being compliant with the terms of the agreement. So I think... I would not like to talk uh, on behalf of Mr. Griffith, thank God. But I think that what needs to be what needs to be really clear is that there is a ceasefire that has been decided on the zone of Hodeida, and this needs to be this needs to be both parties needs to be compliant with that. That's the best part he could play to that regard. Sama Al Hamdani, uh, yeah. when that truce uh, deal was announced in Sweden last month. Uh, how high were your expectations? 
It definitely was better than all the other peace talks that have taken place, and there was a lot of hope just for the sake of uh, the Yemeni spirit to kind of continue. The fact that people had to believe that there's an end to this conflict is really important. But we knew before the peace talks happened, and we knew while they were happening, that this is a process that was forced upon the sides that were fighting. This was kind of international will coming ahead saying, hey, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is really bad, so you guys have to stop this right now. And so we, as we proceed with these peace talks, we have to bear in mind that both sides are not ready to stop the conflict. And we've seen this after the peace talks. As a matter of fact, there have been clashes between the Houthis uh, and the government in the city of Lahj, and you have detainees still being taken and disappearing. Just today, there, were news, uh, there was news that's not confirmed as of yet, but of a woman detainee in Houthi prisons dying while she was in detention. And so we don't know uh, what exactly is happening, but we know that both sides are continuing with this conflict as if nothing has happened. Saudi Arabia it continues to carry out airstrikes in Sana'a and in Hodeida. Both sides are still fighting each other. So we had step one of the peace talks, and what we said then is this is step one of many steps. And this needs a lot of pressure, not just from the UN, but other countries as well. And what we see is that the US has kind of uh, put a lot of attention in Yemen, and this is where I'm at, in the United States. With the Jamal Khashoggi uh, death and assassination, you see that there was a lot of American media attention on what was happening in Yemen, uh, especially in regards to Saudi Arabia. But now, with the government shut down and with local politics kind of interfering with this, it seems that uh, the U.S. attention is on something else, and so the pressure needs to continue to be there, and the world needs to continue to watch this very closely and they need to hold both sides accountable, the Houthis and the government, because they're both looking for a way to just blame it on the other side. And, and I've and, said this at the start. You know, the, the most important thing, if you have peace, if you have peace and if you have a ceasefire that actually holds, that is the quickest way to weaken the Houthi militia on the ground, because they won't have someone else to fight. And then the people in Yemen can kind of see what's going on. And we've talked from the start that this war has done nothing except for strengthen the Houthi militia and give them more of a reason to expand and recruit and, and to kind of carry out. So the easiest way out of this conflict was to have peace and a ceasefire uh, a long time ago. And, and I'll put the same question I put to Anne Gadel in 30 seconds. Samal Alamdani, uh, how do you play it if you're that uh, UN envoy, Oliver Griffiths? How do I, I'm sorry? How do you, how do you go, how do you proceed at this point? Well, obviously he's proceeding very cautiously and he's doing the right things. He needs to meet with each side quietly. And I don't think that naming and shaming is going to work at this point. We're at a very fragile point. What needs to happen is for him to continue reinforcing that they need to see eye to eye. And he needs to be friends with both sides. As far as he's concerned, he's doing the right thing. He's meeting with people. But... He needs the support of the international world, and both sides need to know that this is serious business. This is not jokes. This is a treaty that's going to need to be held, and further violations of this treaty are going to lead to negative, negative circumstances. Now, the alarming thing, which is part of the reality that's happening in Yemen that's not really discussed, is that Yemen is being fractured. It is being divided right now. And the way that a lot of uh, mediators and peace analysts look at Yemen, they look at it with the hopes of having Yemen be one country. But the reality is this war has divided it into many parts. What does this mean? How do you proceed? Are Houthis and the government the only sides that you need to engage with? Or do you also need to engage local actors to ensure uh, Yemen-wide national peace. To, 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 to stop the country from, from fragmenting. We're going to pick up on that point and more when we come back. You're watching the France 24 debate. Tournée notamment ici à Odeda, théâtre d'une bataille acharnée de plusieurs mois. Retrouvez sur France 24 notre série de reportages exclusifs dans le nord du Yémen. Don't miss this series of exclusive reports from Northern Yemen on France 24 and France24.com.
When it comes to romance, the French have the reputation of being passionate, first-rate lovers. Well, Jeannie, we have a lot going for us. French is the language of love. Paris is the city of love. But what's it really like to go out with a French person? What about French dating rules? Or what about French attitudes to marriage, divorce, and infidelity? Join us for the next episode of French Connections Plus, where we give you the ins and outs of the game of love à la française. French Connection Plus, presented by Jeannie Godula and Florence Vilmino. Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, some of the stories we're following for you in the newsroom in Aachen, France and Germany uh, update their historic 1963 treaty, uh, further narrowing ties. The new treaty, less ambitious than what Emmanuel Macron had hoped for. Still, the far right um, calls it signing away sovereignty on both sides of the Rhine. Rescuers continue the search off the Channel Islands for the small plane carrying Cardiff City's record signing Emiliano Sala, the Argentine forward, had taken off from Nantes after saying his goodbyes to his old teammates. Zimbabwe's president condemns what he calls unacceptable violence by security forces in the crackdown on fuel protests that have allegedly left more than a dozen dead. Emerson Menengagwa canceling his trip to Davos. Opening day at the World Economic Forum, Brazil's new far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, promises to privatize, lower taxes, and fight corruption. In business, we'll be crossing to Stephen Carroll at Davos. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Our team has been uh, to Yemen. Uh, this time, six months ago, it was uh, to the southern part. This time it was to the north, to the help areas held by the Iran-aligned Houthi militias. And uh, we're talking about it with, from Washington, Sama al-Hamdani, a uh, visiting fellow at Georgetown University. Welcome back as well uh, to journalist and commentator Hussein al-Bukhadi, who joins us from the Yemen, Yemen's capital, Sana'a. And uh, Anne Gadel, executive uh, director of uh, Paris's Open Diplomacy Institute. Uh, before we see uh, another of those reports that uh, our team brought back, uh, I just want to pick up on something that Sama Al Hamdani said before the break, which is yes. it's not just the UN that has to step up. It's, of course, the nations that make up the UN. One of those nations is France. And uh, it's not been very high. Uh, in the media cycle here, France's backing of the Saudi-led coalition. Indeed, not so much. I mean, the emphasis has really been on the UN mission and monitors, and uh, really the pressure was really on the US, because I think it's thanks to the US uh, pressure, Washington's call in uh, October to, uh, to broker peace talks, and the pressure also on the part of the U American Congress that really led to having these talks uh, in December. However, you're right that in France, voices are not raised really loudly to defend this peace process. Because, for instance, over in the UK, you have uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, who's been very vocal uh, about the conflict in Yemen. We yes. haven't heard that so much here. Why? Well, I think that uh, th there's a historical reason for which the, the UK is really more involved in Yemen, historically, it's been it's been present there. So I think uh, the British diplomats take it really to heart, take it much to heart, and uh, it's no I think it's no uh, it's no surprise that the UN envoy is also British, Martin Martin Griffiths. Uh, on the part of France, I mean, obviously France, I mean, supports. The, I'm not uh, I'm not talking uh, on behalf of the uh, of our minister here, but uh, France supports the peace process as part of the of the UN uh, Security Council. It is true that we have not heard really loud voices concerning uh, this peace process, but I believe that. Or the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Exactly, that's a, that's a delicate matter indeed, because France uh, produces arms, obviously, and sells them all around the world. And I think that's what has been a bit, a bit embarrassing to a lot of uh, European countries. And this is what also they are calling to end the conflict. All right. Yes. The, the civil war in Yemen has provoked uh, what's currently the world's worst humanitarian uh, disaster. This in what was already the Arab world's poorest nation. It's under escort, again, from our authorities, that our teams went to the Houthi stronghold of Sada. Sada is in the north. We must warn you that uh, the report we're about to show you contains graphic images. Sada, 
just a few kilometers from the Saudi border, the historic bastion of the Houthi rebellion. This city has known its fair share of conflicts over the centuries, but the most recent one has all but destroyed it. The little local hospital is overwhelmed with injured, civilians and fighters who we're not allowed to see. The Houthi fighters keep close control of their image and rarely grant access to their strongholds. But they will take us to the children's emergency room. Miners are on the front line of this conflict. One in four of them suffers from malnutrition. It's because of the endless fighting and its economic impact that we see cases like these. If we had enough medication and resources, we wouldn't be facing this health crisis. We've been here for nine days. Her health has just got worse. We've tried everything, but we're losing hope. This pediatric unit is one of the last still going in the high plateau of northern Yemen, where hospitals and clinics have been destroyed in air raids. Tell me what prevented you from coming earlier. The war, of course. It's not just the war, it's the embargo too. This is the third time we've seen this little one here. Where can we send him? To Sana, so he can be treated overseas? Obviously, that's not possible. There's no flights out of Sana. The reality is, we just don't have the means to save this child. It's over for him. This is the least visible but most devastating consequence of the war. A scarcity and lack of everything that will affect generations to come. And Gadel, is there... Um, uh, do you feel as though... I'll go back to the question I asked you a moment ago. Do you feel as though public opinion is becoming more aware in France of the situation in Yemen? Indeed, in France, and not only in France, I mean, worldwide, I think the public opinion, and that is why it's become really important. I mean, it's because uh, the public opinion is more and more shocked by the casualties and the humanitarian crisis that's been going on in Yemen. It's the, the, the most serious one of the century, according to the UN. And so, obviously, in that matter, public opinion is playing a great, great role, yes. Samar al-Hamdani... That re that report was shot in Sada, uh, in the north, the the, the heartland uh, uh, for the Houthis. Uh, tell us about what is right now. The wh where does the power lie? Does it lie in Sada or does it lie in the capital? Definitely lies in the capital. Sada has become such a devastated city that is paying the price of the fact that the Houthi militia started there. Uh, Sada has been devastated previously before this war by, you know, six or, you know, several civil wars that took place there, one of them in which Saudi Arabia participated in directly. So the government was already carrying on a war against the Houthis there in, in the early 2000s. And then after the conflict, it continues to be a site to be targeted during this conflict, even though a lot of the people there are not necessarily Houthi but they're just paying the price for it. And so when we talk about Houthi-controlled area, one of the things that we need to remember is that the Yemeni people under the Houthi control does, does not make them Houthi. They're just Yemeni people managed by a Houthi government. Uh, and that's something that I think Yemenis are, are paying double the price of, you know, in the sense of the siege, they don't get humanitarian aid in, but then they also have to be subjected uh, to be and told what to do and how to do it. In a, in, you know, the Houthi movement has shown itself to be extremely paranoid, very cautious, um, and extremely controlling. And one of the things that the report touched on that's really important is the economic situation of Yemen. And this could be easily uh, remedied by the continue by kind of giving government employees their salaries again. So in a sense, uh, when I speak to my American friends here, I can explain to them what that means because now America has a government shutdown and government employees have not had their salaries for a month. This is what's been happening in Yemen for the past few years. 
which means that many families cannot feed themselves. So not only are they devastated by war, but even uh, be, even if there are things there that they can have, they cannot take it. Uh, they cannot buy things because they don't have their salaries. They cannot pay for school. They cannot pay for medicine. And, and that's really important to kind of return life into normalcy while, while the two sides are fighting, give the employees their salaries back and give them a chance to live. Hussein Abukadi, uh, your thoughts on uh, the what, what you heard uh, Sama say earlier about how uh, the uh, the fighting increases the strength of these militias, militias uh, which have more control now than they did uh, certainly before uh, the assassination of former President Saleh, uh, but uh, who are not winning hearts and minds. I mean, I mean, if they if they are not winning the heart of and mind of Yemeni's people. Uh, they, they will not be still standing after four, uh, almost four years of a full war against Yemen, full blockade, a full uh, destruction. Uh, and uh, just I want to add uh, to what she said that the main problem about the Sweden agreement is that the, the United Nations in that agreement has linked the life of 17 million people who depend on humani outside humanitarian aid with the security situation in, uh, in, in Hudaida and the withdrawal from all forces. We know that Hudaida, according to the United Nations, uh, has uh, is, uh, used to receive 70 percent of the humanitarian aid coming into Yemen. So this means that the Houthi did not actually obstruct any of the food coming into Yemen. And and there, uh, there is another road like uh, it goes from north of Hudaydah called the Sham Road, and then it goes to Sanaa and to other city. It's only maybe two hours or one hour and a half uh, longer. So why the United Nation? Why th they should actually use? and depend on that road till they solve uh, the, the, the security uh, issue in Hudaida. And uh, General Patrick in Hudaida, he has requested uh, from uh, Sana'a delegate or for, from the Houthi that they uh, should do an additional uh, agreement on the on, on, on Sweden uh, because uh, Saudi-led coalition refused to withdraw from uh, east of Hudaida unless the Houthi withdraw from there. So he asked them to withdraw and then uh, he will ask the Saudi-backed forces uh, uh, to take their weapons from that area. And it, I, I don't think that the Ansar al Houthi will agree to that, because one side uh, in a conflict cannot withdraw uh, twice while the other side is still uh, uh, sitting there. And I want to just mention one last thing. It's not a civil war. Uh, it's a war and an international outside intervention. That's why it's called the Saudi-led coalition. It doesn't call it a Yemeni uh, uh, coalition. Uh, and United Arab Emirates, to be honest with you, uh, was not happy with the Sweden agreement because they were thinking they were about to take uh, Hudaida. Uh, I mean, that's why uh, when they met in 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 in, um, in uh, Amman in Jordan about the prisoner exchange, Ansar al Houthi have showed them uh, a list of hundreds of uh, United Arab Emirates backed forces uh, who were taken prisoners uh, during the fight in Hudaida. Those names were not included in Hadi government list to show you that, the, that there is no agreement between Hadi and between the United Arab Emirates. That's why I don't think uh, this agreement will be Im implemented unless the United Nations will take a step and General Patrick must do his job to absorb who is breaking this ceasefire. If he, if he doesn't know who shot at him, I don't think that he can uh, do anything else. Uh, Sama Al Hamdani, do, do you agree that uh, it's not a civil war, it's a proxy war? No, it's definitely a proxy war. It is a regional war. It is a it is a war within a war that then translates into a civil war. There is no doubt that the dynamics from the past three years have turned Yemenis against each other. Whether they're fighting for proxy, uh, you know, for UAE or Saudi Arabia, it is still Yemeni blood that is being shed. And you know, Yemen was composed of tribes and vengeance is such a, a vendetta, is such a, an awful concept that we are trying to shed from tribal culture. And so you can imagine that this war is only creating more vendettas and is creating, uh, the blood that's spilling is, is Yemeni and is creating conflict that is gonna be really hard to remedy. The longer the war lasts, the more Yemen is divided, the more these uh, tribes and coalitions are divided, no matter whom they represent the blood that is being shed and the person who's paying the price is the Yemeni average person. The majority of those who are directing the war, uh, especially from the government side and from um, those who support the, go uh, the government, reside outside of Yemen. But the ones who are paying the price, again, are Yemenis on the ground paying for it. 
And, and of course, as, as you've, other articles have reported, we have uh, mercenaries from other countries that have come to fight in Yemen. But the majority of those who suffer are Yemeni. So to call it a non-civil war is a little laughable because we wouldn't be in the place that we're in today. Uh, and Gadel, it brings us back to something that uh, Sama said at the uh, in part one of our discussion, which is the world's attention was was focused on yes. Yemen at the time when 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 there was the gathering in in Sweden, especially after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, a lot of people voices in Washington uh, rising up against the doings of the new Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Is time on MBS's side? The people's attention is elsewhere now. I'm sorry? Is time on MBS's side in terms of the rest of the world will take its eye off the ball on this one maybe after a while? I don't understand your question. I'm so sorry. Is it, will, will the rest of the world forget what's going on in Yemen? In Yemen? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Obviously, uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia and especially the Crown Prince is a very controversial uh, figure in the region. But I don't think that the attention will be drawn away from Yemen uh, because, uh, you know, of all the, all the airstrikes that uh, keep on going and uh, what's going on in Hodeida, I don't believe that uh, the world attention is going to withdraw from, from this, this region. And the pressure? Uh, the pressure is certainly on Saudi Arabia right now, certainly. And as well on the United Arab Emirates, obviously, after especially what you mentioned, the Khashoggi case, in which allegedly uh, the Crown Prince uh, played an instrumental role uh, it's not yet being being proved, but uh, yes. Obviously. And you heard Hussein al bukhadi mention how Saudi Arabia and the UAE don't always have the same interests. Obviously, obviously they don't they don't have uh, the same interests. Uh, certainly, the United Arab Emirates are are playing a, a personal agenda in uh, in Yemen. I think that they're especially with their support, the support they're given, they're they're giving to the the southern uh, secessionist. Uh, secessionist uh, movement. I think they are looking to, to, to gain uh, geo geopolitical uh, strength in the region, in the Gulf, uh, whereas uh, Saudi Arabia is more trying to contain, uh, well, first of all, a major, a major destabilization on its border and as well as uh, Iranian expansion in the region. Yes. Uh, Sama al-Hamdani, uh, you were saying how there's a risk that Yemen could fragment. Of course, we all remember that uh, three decades ago, it was still two countries. If it, if it fragments again, the country's not going to be two countries. We're talking about a, a really terrifying scenario here. We've seen a similar scenario kind of take place in Iraq and Libya. And so uh, I, I would say that Yemen is heading in that direction. And unfortunately, it's, it's not a natural fragmentation. It is fragmentation that is occurring due to financing, due to taking alliances in this conflict, and due to uh, an opportunity to kind of self-lead uh, when you have uh, a side that's completely controlled by uh, a firm grip of the Houthi militia, and then a side uh, that needs some sort of control that is completely chaotic, and so other groups are stepping up to the plate. So Yemen's scenario is not gonna is not gonna be as simple as reversing back to two countries. That would be actually the best case scenario, is to have uh, the ability to say, hey, we can have two centers and we can operate from it. The problem is uh, that time has passed and that time has changed. And so if Yemen fractures, it'd be many, many. Um, it wouldn't just be one fracture line. It would be several. And I think it would take a long time to kind of settle disputes about who gets to rule over who. So it's, it's really important to pay attention to what's happening in Yemen. And if I may add, we've talked very briefly about the role of France in this, but I think France uh, could have done a lot more for Yemen and could have, um, you know, stated its position against the conflict directly. And so to continue selling arms uh, to Saudi Arabia and to, to not take a step forward is very unlike France uh, in the sense of what we've gotten used to seeing in their, in their foreign policy. And without a doubt, France is facing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, their challenge with their local policies right now, with the Yellow Vest movement, and there's a lot going on in France. But they cannot forget that Yemen is a place where they had a lot of interest and they've always been allies of, of, of peace and they've always promoted for human rights. And so, to me, uh, observing the role of France right now is a little is a little surprising. Uh, uh, Hussein Al Bukhadi, uh, 
people in uh, Yemen, some of them uh, telling our reporters they miss the days of uh, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh, who uh, uh, reunited the country but also had strongman rules. He was forced out at the time of the Arab Spring. Uh, do you regret the days of Ali Abdullah Saleh? Uh, for, of course, maybe uh, you, you will find uh, uh, many people or some people in Yemen that uh, regret the days of Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, and uh, the problem uh, and the cause of that uh, is because what the Saudi-led coalition has done into Yemen uh, when they declared uh, the war. Uh, we know that Yemen has gone in the last uh, 40 to 50 years during many, uh, either you call it a coup or revolution, and most of Yemeni president, either in the north or the south, has been uh, assassin assassinated. But we didn't have a, a, a total uh, catastrophe like, like now because there was no direct international uh, intervention in, uh, in, in Yemen. Uh, but now, I mean, we've seen that people in, for example, in Iraq, uh, people in uh, uh, Libya, people uh, in other, like in Afghanistan, they regret uh, the, 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 their previous maybe president. And the problem is not that the previous president was good. It's because that country like uh, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and uh, the Western country are interfering and have destroyed uh, those country. I do agree with uh, Sama about that Yemeni are the one who are paying uh, the price. And the reason for that it's just because there is some countries like France, United, United Kingdom and United States who are getting uh, the price, who are getting paid uh, by selling billions of dollars in weapons to Saudi-led coalition. Uh, just during uh, uh, the war, uh, the United States has sold, uh, the, struck the largest deal with, the, with Saudi Arabia in, in U.S. history. United Kingdom has increased, according to The Guardian, uh, 500 percent their weapons sell to Saudi Arabia during this war. So I believe that those countries actually are the one that can stop this war because yeah, but you, they, you, hang on, it you, was not you, thanks to them. So Yeah, I, no, I, I agree with that point, Hussein, but I just want to say, you, you yourself saying that there is a culture of violence and a lot of uh, uh, past leaders in Yemen meeting untimely ends. So the question is, going forward now, how do you prevent Yemen from being like Somalia, just a failed state for decades on end with a little fiefdoms? Uh, if, of course, it could be it be, could become uh, like Somalia if the Saudi-led coalition, supported by countries in the West, will all continue down to the Saudi war Arabia? campaign on Yemen. Of course, of course, it was all down to Saudi Arabia. Like I said, in Yemen, we had many. Uh, conflict inside Yemen, and at that time you can call it uh, a civil war, uh, but it didn't end up like this. This is because an outside intervention. They have cut the wages. They moved the bank from Sana'a to, to uh, uh, Aden just to have pressure and to, to try to blame that the Houthi are the reason why 85% of Yemeni budget come from oil and gas, and it's all in the hand of the Saudi-backed forces. There is only one port under the control of uh, the Houthi, which is Hudayda, and still 70% of aid comes through that port, while Saudi Arabia has turned most of port and airports under their control into a military uh, basis. And that's the main problem. They want to control the Yemen coast. That's why we see United Arab Emirates is focusing their work on Sukhatra, on, on Aden, on Babel Mandab, on island in the Red Sea, and on Hudayda, because they think think that if they control that, they will be stronger. They could have uh, like more uh, strength in, in, in the region because Yemen is a strategic area, especially for the United uh, States and United Kingdom. That's why those countries, including France, are fully supporting the war in Yemen. Do you agree with that, Sama Al-Amdani? No, I, I, I think that this conflict doesn't just have one side that's responsible for what's going on. There are many, many sides. And there are many people who are benefiting from the war. And there is, without a doubt, a war economy that is uh, very fulfilling to the pockets of those who are involved who would like to see this war continue. And, and so the best way to do it is to kind of uh, combat the economy of the war and to kind of restore uh, a traditional economy that would work in, in the favor of peace. Uh, without a doubt, the world has kind of turned a blind eye to Yemen and has kind of uh, tried to shed light on it again. And what happened in the past few months was good, but we can't tell if it's going to be enough to save Yemen from, you know, the, the future of turmoil. And you mentioned Yemen could potentially become a Somalia with several fiefdoms uh, that are taking place. And that is unfortunately what Yemen is going to look like if we don't soon find a way 
to uh, find rulers and leaders who are Yemeni, uh, who can lead all of Yemen, who can uh, represent this kind of middle ground. I think what the conflict has done is make everyone extremely radical and go, you know, you're either with the government or with the Houthis, while in fact many of Yemenis who are on the ground who don't get a voice are with neither. Uh, they would like to see peace. And so if we can find uh, leaders that are backed by the international government uh, that can represent that middle ground, uh, the, the, the people who can kind of work with everyone for the sake of the country to move forward. Is that because, doable? You know, if, if we hear... It is very doable. It is very doable. It's just, again, about putting consistent pressure, and it's about identifying individuals who can take that, that, that role. Now, the problem is the people that are in place have been in place for a while, and they benefit from the continuation of war. Um, it's, it's really important, you know, as a, a lot of civilians look to the Yemeni government to kind of uh, carry out and, and deliver services to the Yemeni people, and they're not holding up their part. I think having a government that is accountable to the Yemeni people, especially in Houthi liberated areas, if this government can kind of perform its role correctly, then a lot more people are going to support it. And, and, and a lot more people are going to feel comfortable backing it in this peace process. Uh, but what we see is a lack of trust in the government because they've resided outside of Yemen and because they haven't been able to represent all Yemenis equally. All right, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you so much, uh, Sama Alamdani, for joining us from Washington. Uh, Hussein al uh, in Sana'a and Gadel, thank you for thank being you. with us. Uh, stay with us. There's more to come. And you can see, again, those reports on our website, france24.com.